Kirana. It's really hard to follow Chris Hipkins at Rawiri and to have the grave shift after lunch. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully I'll keep you awake and um, engaged and that you will leave this uh, uh, sharing of knowledge with, with greater knowledge than you already have. So, oh, I've got the thingy, haven't I? Okay. Share with me a prayer. Taku i pukaria, ko toko ia ingaro, te akaruru ia, e te pa, oh, just testing you, <laughs> e te pa me tua, e turanga, kita kita anoko, te korpinia, ki te corona, o te aroha, e ngako. Paroanga no taku ina. My homeland, you are my beloved. United by our forefathers as a firm standing place for me. Surrounded by a crown of love, holding pride of place for my descendants. Who you are matters. Where you come from matters. Who I am matters where I come from matters. Who you identify as matters. Who I identify as matters. How others identify you and me matters. Identity matters. Ko taka runga toku maunga. Taka runga, for those of you who don't know, is in Devonport on the North Shore in Auckland. Ko Waitemata Tokumuana, the beautiful Waitemata. We just won the America's Cup on it not long ago. <laughs> Ko Taki Tumu Tokuwaka. Taki Tumu has very, a lot of names. Over time, it's been called many for many reasons. Taki Tumu originated in Upolo, Samoa, around 1060. We're navigators, we're wayfinders. This waka changed names many times. One of the stories that I think is really important is, is the son of the chief who actually started building Taki Tumu wanted to change the name of this waka. So he sent his wife to his father's village and said to him, <laughs> said to her, look, go and talk to my father. Tell him that I want to change the name of this waka. And I want it to be called after me. And I want it to I want him to make sure that it is called Fa Tunga. His wife, Kare, went to visit his father. She was there for a long time in that village. She stayed many nights with the Fatunga's father. The waka was renamed Te Puri o Kare, the beautiful woman. We call it Taki Tumu because it is for us when it came through the Cook Islands it came through our village, through past um, many islands to Kukiairani on to Aotearoa, New Zealand. Ko Helen Vani Tokuingwa. Yes, I have 42 years in education as a teacher, a senior leader, and a principal. So when Chris Hipkins was in nappies, I was teaching children. I've been president of the North Shore Principals Association, the first Pacifica principal on the North Shore. I've been president of the Auckland Primary Principals Association. This is a brag sheet, by the way. I'm just going to get it out there. <laughs> I've been president of the Auckland Primary Principal Association, the first female Pacifica principal to have led the Auckland Primary Principals. 
I'm an accredited leadership facilitator. I've also been a Māori Achievement Collaboration Facilitator, the most amazing work I have ever done. It's wonderful. All principals, all teachers, all schools to be, need to be involved in that first. I'm currently the Secretary of New Zealand Principals Association and a member of a, quite a wide range of advisory groups to the Ministry. Why they want my opinion, I don't know. Are there any Ministry people here, apart from Tom? Was Tom gone? Tom's gone. Okay, so let me tell you about the ministry. <laughs> the ministry have a great heart, but they are directed down a framework. Our job is to shift that framework to make sure it meets our needs. I'm currently the director and facilitator of Tautai Uli Moana. Now, this is um, a leadership. Uh, capabilities initiative um, and it was led really uh, by a group of principals from New Zealand Pacifica Principals Association, NZPF and the Ministry in, in partnership. We were very lucky to start off with $150,000, woohoo, big money, in 2019. It went nowhere of course, it stayed in a very small pocket but last year we were very fortunate to have Jenny Salisa um, champion us, and we now have just under three million. A oh, good start. I see it as a good start. It's not the end. It's not the end. We want to be in every school. We've started with schools where there are high numbers of Pacifica learners. So percentages high, we get in there. Our next step is to get into schools with any Pacifica learners because that's where we need to make a difference. And then finally, because everyone wants to marry Pacifica, <laughs> we're going to get into every school. You laugh, it's true. Look, look at us, come on. Why would you not want to marry this? Okay, I'm 64, but still, you know, still, you know, I've got time on my hands. Yeah, <laughs> just don't tell my husband. <laughs> okay, if what I present to you today, you read the rest. Okay, I'm hard hitting. If you don't know this stuff, then it's either your very first day or you might need to think of another profession. Because it is simple, it is basic. Minister Hipkins said it this morning. We know these things, we've heard about these things, they've been going on for a long time. Well, for goodness sake, make a change. Do something different that is going to change the way uh, the outcomes meet for our Pacifica learners. Here are the answers. Study them, and then you can have your sleep. Because the next 30 slides, hopefully, hopefully, well, I don't really want you to sleep, but the next 30 slides, hopefully, will get you engaged in understanding and how these things can change. There's only five. They're research driven. There's evidence to prove that these five things make a difference when meeting the needs of our Pacifica and our Māori, and, dare I say it, all learners in our education system. So, now that you know those things, what does it look like in action? What does respecting and valuing identities, languages and cultures look like? Well, first of all, you really need to know who you are. You need to understand where you come from. You need to care about why you behave the way you behave. Because only in doing that will you truly care about what other people come from, about why other people behave and react the way they do. You really need to get to know your students. Relationships, relationships, relationships. This has been around for years, hasn't it? Yep. Hard to do sometimes, especially when our children are nervous about sharing who they are. Especially when our children actually don't always know who they are. And especially when we don't have time. This is important, yet it's put at the bottom. 
bottom. We need to have time to learn to build relationships with people. We need to privilege other languages. I was in a conversation this morning with a teacher who wanted to privilege, privilege language. What language was it, sir? Was it French? Spanish? No? French. Good on you. But let's privilege te reo first, and then our Pacific languages, because we have a very strong co connection with this, and then by all means French. But, you know, that's the order it really needs to be done in. Every single teacher in the profession should be able to speak te reo. Te reo. Then after that, it's kukiarani. <laughs> I think my Samoan heritage might disagree. Yeah. You need to grow a deep understanding of culture and why we think and react the way we do. And why do we have to do all these things? Because it's written in the statement of the National Education and Learning Priorities, the government's priorities for education in this country. There are five key, better put my glasses on, objectives. And within those five key objectives, everything we do in our schools must meet them. Do you know this document well? Is it, is it in your strategic direction in your school? Is it in your behaviours in your school? Do you see the priorities, and there's eight of them, do you see the priorities actioned within your school? Are learners at the centre? Is there barrier-free access to education in your school? Does quality leadership and teaching exist? Is the future of learning and work a really strong priority in your school? And if we look at um, tertiary education, is there a world-class, inclusive public education transitionary program right the way through? These are the priorities that your board of trustees and your senior leadership will be reporting on. In 2023, the NEGs and the NAGs, which are really for your boards and your senior leadership, the National Education Guidelines and the um, National Administrative Guidelines, these will be replaced by statements that actually link close, closer to the NELPs. So by 2022, this document needs to be living, breathing and walking within your school. Okay, the next thing we need to do in order to ensure we meet the five criteria that I talked about earlier is that we need to, and um, Dr Rawiri spoke about it clearly, we need to build collaborative and reciprocal partnerships. This is not about just building communication. This is not about just greeting or sharing data. This is actually about growing deep and meaningful relationships with the whānau, the students, the people, the community that actually feed into our schools. This means that we make decisions together. So this isn't about you teaching a subject, as was spoken earlier. This is about us teaching people. How do we make a difference in the lives of um, our students, Pacifica in particular? Well, actually, that difference starts from birth. They're already learning. They're already growing. They're already meeting their needs. Their parents are doing this. Their communities, their friends are doing this. By the time they get to you, they have very, very different needs. And that's what we need to unpack a little bit more. I'll get to that. So building and maintaining reciprocal home and school partnerships. Again, there is masses of research on this. Look closely at the behaviours um, evidenced in the best evidence synthesis. Look at the ERO reports that talk about building and maintaining 
reciprocal partnerships. This is not new to us. It's time we need. It's people to drive this we need. And it's really at the heart. Um, Dr Rawari, I seem to be using his presentation quite a lot, talked about um, changing minds and habits. Now before we do that, we need to change our hearts. We need to look closely within and see that we're willing to change behaviours to meet the needs of our Pacifica learners. Now if the NELPs didn't help you, then the Action Plan for Pacific Education is another document that I'm going to test you on later. Okay? This is again the government's plan for action for Pacific Education, but you are mentioned in there. These are the things that you need to look closely at because when you are mentioned in there, the expectation is that you know, you understand, and you can deliver the goods that are being asked for. Again, in the action plan, there are five key priorities. Isn't that great? So the NELPS and the action plan for Pacific Education link. There's five things. Those five things link closely. Again, it's about working reciprocally with diverse Pacific communities. It's about confronting systemic racism. That's about ensuring that our children have the best quality ed education. And if you look back at the NELPs, it's about barrier-free access and learners at the centre. It's about enabling every teacher, leader and educational professional to take coordinated action to become culturally competent. It's about ensuring that we grow and we retain and we value highly competent teachers. I do disagree with some of the document. I didn't a few, well, 10 years ago I didn't. I used to think the best teacher for a Pacifica student was a Pacifica teacher. I really did believe that, but, but we know that's wrong. The best teacher for our Pacifica students is the best teacher, regardless. What we do need to have is teachers who have open hearts, open minds, and are willing to participate in being within the Pacific culture. Okay, so these are the do this is the document here that asks you to make some, oh sorry, wrong one. This is the document here that asks you to make some shifts and changes. It asks you to consider cultural competence. It asks you to consider different ways of behaving. It asks you to think about what you've done in the past, how effective it's been, and what you can change about that. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you to do that now in just a moment. There's one thing I want you to know is that Pacifica people are mathematicians, they're technicians, they're designers and creators. They have been for centuries. Stand up. Come on, stand up. We are going to learn to do the SEBA. It's really important. This is called coding. Okay, it's coding. I know that's a difficult word, especially for people of my age. When I point to the sky with one finger, you're going to go, go that way, okay? So when I point to the sky, okay. when I point to the sky with two, sorry, two fingers, you're going to go, okay? So coding, remember? When I point to the ground with one finger, one finger, you're going to go, and you can bend down. Okay. And when I point to the ground with two fingers, you're going to go, awesome. So should we just have a practice? Okay, let's see how good you are. I just want to, you to know I taught a group of five-year-olds this the other day. They were awesome, but no pressure on you. Okay, so ready. Oh, good. 
is this? Okay, ready to go. And that we need to see culturally, culturally, that it should be valued and not seen as a extra to what we're doing. Now I'm just going to go back to this. Whoops, that one. Remember the five things. I'm going to keep reminding you of them. You don't have to take them down again because they're still the same. But it's just to remind you that there are five key things, critical actions that you need to be able to meet the needs of our Pacifica learners. Okay, high expectations. Oh my goodness. I think that was around when I was at school in the 70s. Have high expectations. Highlight our strengths. Oracy. Look at me. I can stand up here and talk to you. Oracy is something that we are strong in. Differences that we are strong in it in several languages. The only language that valued in the education system, though, over the past was English. We have to change that. And it is changing, and I, and I have to admit, I've heard some amazing secondary school um, students speaking their heritage languages in such beautiful, beautiful ways. I want you to know that New Pacifica is the fastest growing group of people in New Zealand. And yes, it is true, they do want to marry us. <laughs> I did, I told you that before, but that's true. Because we're the fastest growing, not only are we the fastest growing of people coming in, apart from COVID, I have to say, we produce the most children, the most beautiful children. Our blood mix really are quite stunning. <laughs> now have a look at them, come on. You need to expose Pacific learners to people of Pacific heritage who have talents. We need to expose them to the writers, the technicians, the scientists, the doctors, the musos, the dancers, so that they can see that there is a pathway, should that be the one they want to take, of people already on that journey. You need to grow a Pacific lens. So what does a Pacific lens look like? A Pacific lens is having the eyes, the heart, and then the action of someone who truly cares about how well our Pacific learners do. The interesting thing is, is that what is Pacific? What is Pacifica? If you look at the ministry information, there are 17 different ethnic groups considered to be Pacific. But we know that there are hundreds. Okay? We know there are hundreds of different groups of Pacific peoples. We just haven't figured out who they are yet. The other thing is, is that in our education system, we have blood mixes. So we have Pacific Palangi. We have Pacific Asian. We have Pacific Maori. We have Pacific Pacific. In fact, maybe it's Pacifica. People will marry anyone. <laughs> maybe, I've, maybe I've got it around the wrong way. I'll have to think about that. My husband's English, by the way. Um, 
You have to be positive and see the humour in Pacifica. If you are teased, if you are willing to laugh, then you are actually liked. We really put people down, but in a nice way, in a really nice way. My grandson said to me the other day, Grandma, you're not really old. You're just older than Grandpa. And I sort of thought, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm really old and older at the same time? He's five, by the way. And he said to, and so I asked him that, and he said to me, oh, God, no, Grandma. He looks much older, but you think really old. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Make sure you connect with culture. This is what, this is what uh, young students say about connecting to culture. Hopefully you don't get all the adverts. Practices of Pacific people have navigated oceans. These practices have been left behind by the education system. It's time for the education system to catch up with these innovative practices of our Pacific communities. Now, it's time to make a shift. Let's partner with our families and our young people to plan for their future. E rabe kapiti ana tato te tamo o nga api e mea pia pa o teia e orana na teia e te akasupu i te o moe moea e te parani a te o mitsua tupu tamata matarato o tamari. Let's get more great Pacific teachers and leaders and look after the ones we have. Yeti is a role model. She teaches me to believe in myself. COVID showed us how strong our community is. We need all our communities to collaborate for change. Now, it's time to shift. Okay. So be who you are. That's what we want our children to understand. Be who you are in this society. It's much harder than you think. A question um, someone asked me the other day was, if you decolonise all the work, all the things that we have in our schools, what do we replace it with? And I thought about it. You know, these are deep questions. I was ready for a joke, but... It was a deep question. And I thought about it afterwards and I thought, well, decolonising doesn't mean getting rid of everything. What it means is it's starting to value alongside everyone else other colonies, other villages, other people, other voices other languages. So at the moment, the decolonisation has driven one way. And we've lost everything else. So come on, this is your job. No biggie. Just help to decolonise the system and put in place something that's workable for all. You can do that by knowing your bias. Oh. You can do that by knowing your bias. That's the starting point. Understanding why you behave the way you behave. Everyone holds unconscious beliefs about various social, cultural and identity things. And these biases stem from our own cultural upbringing. I have them, you have them. What we want to do is to bring those unconscious biases to the foreground. Make them conscious and think about them before we do them again. Because if we keep them unconscious, very little is going to change. So isn't it better to stand up there and say, I don't think what you're doing is correct, and I think that's wrong because of this, than saying, oh, behind the back, that person really hasn't got it, have they? You know, they're back in the 50s, which was a good time, by the way. Um, <laughs> 
they're back in the 50s and they really don't know what they're doing. We need to bring consciousness, conscious bias to the foreground. The government's calling it racism. We need to bring racism up and talk about it because it exists. So know your own bias. I'm going to go to the next one. Whoops. Here we go. Value languages, cultures and identities. I was so fortunate a couple of years ago to go to Nui. The New Zealand Pacifica principals went there. Uh, we delivered a whole lot of workshops to the teachers and um, staff in the schools in Nui. What a magical place. Who's been there? Who's been to Nui? Oh, it's my happy place. Apart from the mall, it's my happy place. <laughs> and in particular shoe shops, <laughs> yeah, this is my happy place. There are 1,500 people living on Nui. There are 15,000 Nuaeans living in New Zealand. What does that tell you? Now, of the 15,000 Nuaeans living in New Zealand, a large percentage of that are in our schools, okay? What do we want for our Nuaean people. We want to grow them. We want to help them understand what a beautiful place they have. We want them to value that place and we want them to go home regularly to build what they've got there into a magical place for the rest of the Nuaean community. It just broke my heart when I saw only 1,500 people still there in this magical place. By the way, don't go. Um, it's really expensive to get there, and I've already booked out all the flights when they start. <laughs> Make sure you know the history of Pacific people, particularly in Aotearoa, New Zealand. This is my dad. He was born in Utilea in Samoa. He came to New Zealand in 1951. He came here because there was virtually nothing left for him there to do. He did not want to be a fisherman. He did not want to be a farmer. He came to New Zealand and was a sweeper on the wharf. He cleaned up the mess. He didn't want to be a fisherman. He didn't want to be a farmer. Do you think he wanted to be a sweeper? No. No. But my father was a bit of a, um, I suppose he was an opportunist. He worked on the wharf uh, in Queen, uh, down in Auckland. And um, every Thursday, the, um, they used to get their pay. And the crane driver, who was standing in front of him, was pretty drunk. He'd been out for lunch and he was going to get his pay and then go back out drinking again. And um, the foreman came out and said to him, no, nah, you're not going to be, a, can't put you up in a crane, you'll kill yourself or you'll kill someone else. So he took him out of the line and sent him home. So my dad was next in line. So dad said, um, does a crane driver earn more than a sweeper? And the foreman said, of course. He said, I can drive a crane. <laughs> stood there really, really, you know, sort of showing that confidence that Samoan men had in those days. And the foreman said, oh, great, I'll put you in there. Well, Dad prayed all day <laughs> that he wouldn't kill anybody. He prayed all day that someone would show him what all those levers were inside this machine. He also prayed because he didn't like heights. <laughs> and he realised he was going to have to go up this crane every day. But the Samoan community got behind him. By the end of that week, my dad could drive a crane. And by the end of that week, my mum and dad had far more money than they would have had if he hadn't been that cheeky man. My mother came from Titikavaka in Kukiarani. She arrived in New Zealand uh, the year after dad did. She actually came to New Zealand to become a nun. 
She met my father walking down the gangplank of the ship that she arrived on. He took one look at her and knew that this was the woman for him. He carried her bags all the way up to St Benedict's, which is, which is the church at the top of Queen Street. Said to the nuns there, she's just staying for a little while, I'm coming back for her. <laughs> they were married within six weeks. So is he an opportunist? Oh yeah. So I have six siblings. In the 50s, my parents lived in uh, Ponsonby, Greylin, in Auckland. That's traditionally where all the Pacific Islanders went. They lived in a boarding house, so they had one room for my mum and dad, my sister, and I was born in 1950. And um, so we... <laughs> I was just a baby, come on. Um, so we lived in this boarding house, but in 1957, the then government offered Pacific Islanders these wonderful homes in Onihunga, Otahuhu, um, South Auckland, where they were building these beautiful state houses. My dad worked on the wharf as a crane driver, and he thought, hmm, that would take me two hours to get to work. I'm not doing that. We lived in Clarence Street in Ponsonby in those days. So mum and dad were getting to the point where they were going to have to move. But my father, being one of those really happy souls, said, nah, let's go for a picnic. We'll catch the ferry to that place over there, across the water. We'll go over there and we'll have a picnic and everything will be well. So they waited an hour for the ferry to go to Devonport from the city. They got over to Devonport and blow me down. Dad walks across the street, up on the sign, it says... Clarence Street. My father was very superstitious. So he walked Clarence Street and there was a beautiful house there and it had a big sign out the front there apparently that said rooms for rent. Not room, rooms for rent. He thought this is a sure sign. My parents, my sister and myself moved to Devonport Clarence Street in 1957. It changed our lives. I live a kilometre away from that house now. I've never left that community. What we want for our Pacifica people is to grow in their communities, eh? We were the first Pacific family in Clarence Street. I went to St Leo's School, which is a Catholic school um, there, very small, very beautiful, loved it, and then on to Belmont Intermediate and Takapuna Grammar. Um, my brothers and sisters did the same. You see a picture of seven Pacific people there. One of them is a um, engineer. He's a tall one at the back. One of them was a session drummer. He could not sit still as a kid. He just spent his whole time tapping things. One of them reconditions engines. She runs her own business. One of them spent 30 years in the armed forces, five of them in the SAS and five of them training the SAS. He recently um, worked in the Middle East but had to come home when COVID broke. He did not want to be stuck there. So now he drives a truck and loves it. Absolutely loves it. Nobody argues with him. Yeah. <laughs> One of them is an international tax lawyer she retired at the age of 51 and now sort of volunteers in the school where I was uh, the principal. One of them uh, is an accountant and works for Inland Revenue and she focuses on um, big business. And then there's me and I was a principal. We were all successful Pacific Island people. So what has changed from then to now? It's a question I want to ask you. What has changed from then to now? Lots has changed. We are not seen anymore as being those people. We are not seen... Oh, by the way, my niece just graduated as a doctor. So I'm so proud. Surgeon at Middlemore Hospital. I'm not... You know, I'm really proud. Anyway... Why is it 
that groups of Pacific Islanders are highly successful in our education system and groups of them are not, okay? It has to do, first of all, not, sorry, it has to do, first of all, with family. And then it has to do with school. But not just you. It's all the other people around us at school. It's our friends. It's our, the students that we grow up with. I was really fortunate in 1972. Why? Have a look at that class. Why do you think that was the best class I could ever have been in? <laughs> I married one of them, by the way. Um, <laughs> yes. That was 5ME. We were streamed in those days. I'd come from a language grouping. I'd done, <laughs> the third and fourth form, do they still call it that? No. I, was, uh, I did Latin and French. Yeah. And then we were tested. Okay, and I came out having believe it or not, a mathematical brain. So I was put down the math stream. Best thing that ever happened to me. Because those boys taught me how to stand up for myself. Those boys taught me to believe I could do it. They were like my brothers. Many of them still are. So it's not just you that makes a difference. It's not just your parents that makes a difference. It's the people around you who you grow up with that make a difference. This is the one I married. Okay, so it's an old photo, but never mind. <laughs> okay. When I first met James Varney, I thought, ooh, I don't really like him. He's a soccer player. <laughs> my dad was really into rugby. But when I brought him home, my parents realised that he might be white. He might be green-eyed. He might be English. But he was brown on the inside because he had a heart for Pacifica. He wanted to learn the ways in which my family grew up. He wanted to understand why, when Dad spoke, we all listened. He wanted to understand why we all had jobs in our house and that we all worked together to be a part of it. He wanted to understand why we went to church and why we had strong faith, because he didn't have that in his house. He wanted to understand why at 18, when I went to work, all my money went to my dad. Every cent I earned went to my father and my mother to help them bring up the rest of my brothers and sisters. He thought that was wrong, until we had children of our own. <laughs> but by then, you see, it's too late, because those systems change, the background change. But for Pacifica, it's not about you individually. It's actually about the collective. We are very similar to Māori. We work together. So one of my brothers was going to university. My income and my sister's income was about paying for him. It was about making sure he got everything because we knew he was going to be someone special. Pacifica are very different. Now, this is why people want to marry us. Look at my two sons. They're the most handsome boys ever. They really are. My oldest son is a financial analyst. He has a mathematical, mathematical brain, just like his mother. He absolutely loved Takapuna Grammar. It was his happy place. His maths teachers there are teachers that he still talks about today. He thinks that they are the most amazing people and he couldn't understand why they wanted to be teachers when they could be earning three or four times that amount of money. My son at 28 earned more than me as a principal after 10 years. I'm so proud of him. Unfortunately, give your money to your parents was not one of those things that really followed through. <laughs> Seems to be parents give your money to your children still. My youngest son, school didn't suit him. He spent most of his time in the hallway. I remember going first to um, his first school, because luckily I didn't take him with me when I was teaching. <laughs> he was at other schools. Um, I remember going first to uh, a meeting with the principal of his school that he went to um, to find out why uh, Michael was sitting in the hallway all day long and had um, not been able to eat his lunch. Then I found out that Michael, in fact, had eaten everyone else's lunch. 
um, and that um, when he was in the hallway, he decided that singing was going to be something he really liked to do. He'd learnt a few um, songs, a kapahaka, and he just sang them. He was giving them a message, though, and the message was that he didn't understand what was going on in class. Unbeknownst to us, Michael was dyslexic. He couldn't read. He memorised things. So when he got to the next stage of reading the next book, he really couldn't do it until he'd heard it, seen it, memorised it, and then pretended he could read it. So school for him was a real challenge. Michael today runs his own building company. It's called Raw. He um, works on movie sets, designing and building movie sets in Auckland. He has four boys working for him. The four boys that work for him were all his friends at Takapuna Grammar. All five of them were real troublemakers at school. On their reports at the end of each year, you could read uh, a few things that would really scare you. But they are successful. They all have families of their own. They're happy. Um, but they don't talk about school the same way that my son James talks about them. It saddens me. We don't want our children to talk that way. We need to value and validate cultural knowledge. We need to understand why our kids are failing in our school system. Not all of them. Not all of them. We need to understand why some of them are failing in our school system. So if we understand that our children going into the system that we have now have different values, different beliefs, different understandings, different faiths, understand service, different languages, are we prepared as teachers to ensure that they get the best quality that they can get? Are you, in fact, the best teacher for them? I hope so. Now, the most important people in my life are these people. Rawiri talked about it this morning. Your mokopuna. I always thought I had the best life ever. I always thought, I am so lucky that my children are beautiful children. They've got beautiful women in their lives. My husband, well, you know, I've not quite trained him right yet, but it's only been 42 years. Um, but when that first grandchild arrives, you know what's been missing in your life. And it changes the way you look at things. It made me realise very, very quickly that things have to change in our system for my mokopuna and everyone else's. And that I'm part of that change and so are you. So these four beautiful children will be the future. They will make the decisions for us. Well, not for me, because mine have already been made. For you when you are old. They will be the ones that write the policy. They will be the ones that enact the policy. My grandchildren know very well when I get old, I'm going to live with them. My grandson has a bunk bed. <laughs> I'm allowed on the top. <laughs> when I get really old, he says I can sleep up there. There's no mention of putting me in a home, although my sons say they're going to have me um, stuffed. What's that called when you get stuffed? <laughs> yeah, take, go, take me to a taxidermist. They're going to sit me on the couch, put the remote in my hand, and then they can still talk to me while I'm there. But, but these are the children that are going to make the decisions for us. So we have a responsibility not only to them, but to ourselves and to our futures to make sure that they know and that they can understand and they will follow this up for us. So, I thought I'd throw this one in there because it's such beautiful family. Family is everything to Pacifica. It's what makes us whole. So when we talk about reciprocal partnerships with families, it's about the whole family. When my son Thomas went to his first uh, they called it a conference. At his school, I was there. 
The teacher looked at me sideways and thought, oh, she's the principal from down the road. I'll better watch what I'm saying. She was amazing. She was absolutely amazing. My grandson talked about his learning to us. He shared what he was good at doing. He told us he loved mathematics. I thought, oh, it's following through in the generations. He talked about how important it was that he asked really good questions in class. He talked about how his teacher doesn't tell him the answers. Why not, he said. And he talked about how much he loved being at school with the rest of the students in his class. That's what we want from our kids, eh? Just throw those up there again, just to remind you what the five things are that you need to shift in order to change. Now, something I want to talk to you about now has to do with my husband. He's the skinny guy under the um, col de obisque. He's a cyclist. Are, are there any cyclists here? Mm. I think anything over two kilometres you get in a car. But um, <laughs> he, rides, he rides about 100 k's um, Saturdays and Sundays. And during the week he's got this shed that he calls a gym, but it's just a shed, where he's got a little bike there and a TV screen. I said to him, if you move a fridge in there, I'm leaving you. But um, he has this screen that he rides, these um, rides all over the world. He loves to do these rides. For the last seven years, we've been going overseas, luckily, not last year, unfortunately, to Italy, France, um, Croatia, so he could do Spain, so he could do these rides. He does not ride alone. He rides with a group of friends. His friends surround him to support him to ride. His friends range in age from 30 to 75. The 75-year-old has knowledge beyond belief in cycling. The young one, well, they just call him the young one, eggs everyone on to do better than what they did last time. Cycling is a really big part of his life, and you can see that in what he's bought his grandchildren. <laughs> Now, those grandchildren have several bikes, not just one. And when they ride their bikes, he talks to them about some different things that cycling has to do with life. And he talks to them about cycling in ways that sort of made me think, well, this is about Pacifica learning. So he talks to them about the tailwind the tailwind, actually, you're born with one. You're born with a tailwind. Your family is part of your tailwind. Your, um, I've lost my notes, sorry, I keep talking. Your language is part of your tailwind. Your culture and your identity, your socioeconomic group is definitely part of your tailwind. Your friends, your home, your birthplace, your country and your education are all part of your tailwind. He talks about how important tailwind is in for cycling because when you get on your bike and you're by yourself and you're trying to get from A to B and it's an uphill um, cycle that you're going on, if you've got a tailwind behind you, then you can actually get up that hill so much easier. Think about that in terms of education. If we provide our children with a tailwind, instead of calling them the tail, things shift. Everything changes. Because when our kids come to school, that's the first time they meet a headwind for some of them. A headwind slows you down. It challenges you to think about, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm doing. Part of the headwind when you go to school are your parents, sadly, because the parents start to get anxious. They start to see what other children are doing and thinking, oh, my kid doesn't do that. What am I going to do about that? So anxiety starts to build. Part of that headwind is their socioeconomic group. 
because I can't have all the things that everyone else has got. All of those things there become part of their headwind. If they are left alone to face this, it becomes really difficult. And anxiety builds in our children. And it builds from day one at school. So by the time they get to you at 12 and 13, they've already had 12 years, oh sorry, seven years of real headwind issues. So how do we change that? I'll get somewhere else first. We also have the crosswind. The crosswind sneaks up on you. It can knock you off your bike wherever you are. It can knock you off your ground wherever you are. It makes you feel that there is no way that you can change the things that you've, you're doing because it's invisible. The crosswind actually affects everyone. When you're a cyclist, it's really dangerous to be riding in a crosswind because you cannot protect yourself at all. So what do we need to do to, make, to take away the headwind and the crosswind to ensure that our children still get the tailwind? Okay, it's really simple, and this is what my husband told me. You become part of the peloton. Okay? In the peloton, you can lead. Interesting, eh? In the peloton, you can be last in that group. In the peloton, you can be in the middle, protected. You can be on the outsides, protected. But you are still in the peloton because everyone in that group protects you and takes you along. So what we want is our children to be in a peloton. And we need to understand who the peloton is. Now, that's just an, a way of talking it through the work that my husband does in riding. But it sort of made me really think about what part of the peloton am I when working with Pacifica learners? And how can I shift and change it so that there's no crosswind, that the headwind is still there but they're protected, and that we no longer become the tail but we go with the tailwind? I talked to you about the five things. What are they? Think about it. Because it's those five things that are going to make a difference. Those five things will wrap around those children to become part of the peloton. I did have a, um, a face, what is it, a Facebook video of a young man um, called um, Malanga Oku Sotino, who goes to Bishop Viard. But my Facebook skills are very limited and I can't show it to you. But this young man just won the um, Entrepreneur of the Year last year, the Yes Awards, uh, for working in, with a group of students uh, and creating a product for sale. And within his um, presentation, it reminded me so much of the Peloton, because he talked about how his teachers supported him. His friends got in behind him. His family backed him up. His brothers and sisters were proud of him and showed him that he could do it. All of the things that we need to be able to do to work with our children to be successful. Now, my last word is about tapasa. It's only a very short one. Come to my workshop because you'll see how tapasa will help you to become part of the peloton. Kiorana, Kiorana Koto Kathoto, thank you very much. Sorry. 
So like, for example, we're not just sportsmen. We're not good at, it's not just sports we're good at, although I have to say I was really good at it. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, excuse me, you're looking at the junior jiu-jitsu champion from 1967. <laughs> New Zealand junior jiu-jitsu champion. Um, we're not just good at um, maths. We're not just good at oral language. We are good at lots of things. So with all strengths, as soon as you start to list them, you see the things that aren't there. So I'm sorry if that's the way you saw it, but certainly not. Please don't ever consider that. Everyone has strengths in all sorts of ways, and those strengths become contextual. So wherever you are, your strengths vary. Yes. Okay, so we, I, I went through a streamed system. I'm not saying it was right for now. It was right for then. Okay. What we have to understand is within that system, things change. And we've got to look at where we're heading. So in those days, we were put down pathways. For example... I was going to be a teacher from the moment I went into school because my father told me that's what I was going to do. So going through the system meant that that's what I was doing. He was going to have an engineer. He was going to have a doctor, but unfortunately none of us were that bright. But in those days, that's what we did. We went down, we did the pathways that supported the family within a structure that actually allowed that to happen. Nowadays, of course, we're planning for the futures that we, we know now are different to what they were when we were at school. So we have to look more carefully about how we set up our students for success in our schools and, unfortunately, for failure. I'm not a fan of streaming. I'm actually a fan of mixed ability. That's ensuring everybody gets that support within a framework of um, sharing and caring. And that's why I talked about the peloton. You don't, always, you don't always have the best riders in there. What you have are the people who are able to work together as a team. Moana. So in terms of looking at the moana, um, so as part of Pacifica, New Zealand Pacifica Principles Association, our journey in ensuring that Pacifica um, outcomes are improved, we first ensure that we have strong connections to te tiriti o waitangi. We believe the moana, the land, the, the, water, the ocean, the land, the space, is vital to our growth. A reminder that Pacific people are navigators. We, before we come to school, we're already navigating several cultures. So when we get to school, be aware that we are actually quite strong, but we close down because something in that space doesn't allow us to be the navigator that we have been all that time. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. personal narrative into a clear message for us about what sh should happen for Pacifica going forward. And so I'd like to just add to that, I've got a nice little whakatoki for that, and it's from the um, 17th century French philosopher Nicolas Boileau, which says, ce qui se conçoit bien s'énonce clairement, et les mots pour le dire arrivent aisément, which means what is well conceived expresses itself clearly, as you did to us today, and the words with which to express it flow easily. Mm. And so I think that's what you did for us today. Mm. Kia ora. Kia ora.
and I have a uh, little something for you. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, you know the drill. Want a Pacifica? Bit slow off the mark here. Want a PPTA? Let us endorse. Uh, Simon has shared wonderfully how you've woven your personal attributes. We'd like to acknowledge that. Want a Pacifica? Thank you very much for navigating us in the space of, it takes a village to raise a child. Te nā koe, mei taki māta. Te nā rawa tu koe, kei te māre kūra. E kua kua na te ngākau. He navigated us in that space and being an opportunist and growing a community within the Pacifica and the wonderfulness of the five critical actions. And there you are, you're providing the actions and the fruition and the blossoming. Me taki mata te nā koe kei te māre kura, te nā rā koe. O tira te nā rā tautu katoa. From here, ladies and gentlemen, 2.35 we'll be conducting the next workshops. Yes, you're looking at the times. We know what the times are. And as Helen would say in the wonderful language of uh, Matewa, Anthony, what is happening from here? Oh, Cameron. From here, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to invite Cameron to the Palladium to give us an update. <laughs> You've got upstanding, and we've just finished outstanding. Cameron, take your place. Kia ora tato. I think outdated is a little harsh, isn't it, Vinny? Um, so, uh, kia ora koutou. Um, we will now be moving into the concurrent breakout sessions for the rest of the day. All of the breakout venues are located on this level, and the name of each venue is dis uh, displayed clearly outside each room. Refer to the agenda on your app or on the digital screen in the foyer for the session names and locations. Um, please note that each workshop, workshop session is presented once, uh, while the research papers will be repeated, uh, being presented in two different time slots. This room that we're in, the Lampton Room, is being divided into one and two. Um, so if you're staying in here, please um, be mindful of that. You can see the tracks um, where it's going to be divided um, up on the roof. So make sure that you don't have any, uh, any belongings or have any body part uh, in that division there. Um, for the quiz night, if you're attending the quiz tonight at 6 p.m., you can choose to make your own way to St. John's, which is on uh, Waterfront, just off Cable Street, or meet at the conference registration desk in the foyer at 5.45, and we'll walk over as a group. The walk will take about eight minutes. Uh, when we get to the venue, uh, platters and a drink will be provided, and a cash bar is available for any additional drinks. Uh, and we'll start tomorrow morning in here, keynote three at nine o'clock. Kia ora koutou. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>